Okay, thank you everyone for uh, for having me. Yeah, I was really looking forward to uh, the conference and personal reasons have to be uh, at home with my family this summer. I've been watching some of the talks online. It looks like a really great time. There's many people there I haven't been in too long and it would be really nice to be there with you in person, so. Um, yeah, so I, I gave this talk a really kind of uh, uh, pretentious title, I guess, but, uh, and, and then of course, like I prepared it and it came out a lot more technical than the, uh, the, the really, uh, uh, the, the thing I, I feel in my heart and have trouble expressing. So I'm gonna try and express uh, uh, something just in the beginning of, of the talk a little informally. And, uh, and, and that's kind of what, what the, title is supposed to be getting at, and we'll see uh, how I do it at uh, living up to it. So uh, so when I was a grad student, I, uh, you know, started learning about the Langlands program. And uh, I guess there were uh, a couple entry points for me. Well, certainly the Corvellis volume that uh, that this is all based on was, was a big one. But when I tried, well, when I tried navigating the geometric Langlands literature, it was sort of very straightforward in a certain way. Like for every local system, there should be an eigenchief, at least irreducible local system. And well, and then there should be some equivalence between D modules on bun G and essentially quasi co of log cis, but very quickly uh, people, people always knew that was wrong, but very quickly the, the right formula for the right-hand side, you should say inco nilp instead of, uh, instead of quasi-co on the on the spectral side. And this is uh, the correct incantation. And so that was something that was kind of very neat and tidy in some way. It was a different statement, but uh, kind of very similar flavor. Whereas, you know, when I was learning the kind of arithmetic side of things, like, well, I, I looked, what do the Langlands conjectures say? And what I saw was the statement about functoriality, which was like kind of hard to wrap my head around, but very clearly would imply like Artin's conjecture for, for L functions for finite Galois representations, which was nice. But then, you know, the actual like thing I learned in the non-abelian case was Delin's construction of l representations for like the Ramanujan function. And that constructed l function, representations. It wasn't of the same nature as the, it didn't fit into the functoriality conje conjecture, which didn't know l things. And so then I learned other conjectures that encompass one thing, but not the, and and like, what's the Langlands conjecture about? Is it sort of like, you know, L2-ish stuff, kind of real analytic things, or is it, uh, you know, many parts of the subject are end up dealing with like torsion cohomology and symmetric spaces, and those should have piatic automorphic forms, but as far as I can tell, those aren't really uh, uh, quite defined, but, I mean, beyond things coming from cohomology, and so, just the whole thing was kind of like a conceptual mess for many reasons. Probably some of them are are just uh, me, and some of them are are that it's kind of inherently a little messy. And, and I, I I had this feeling that like the the ultimate I don't know that there's something missing somehow. And so what I want to say is uh, in the talk is, is which by the way everything I'm going to say essentially was was covered already in Shin Wen's talk. Shin Wen's talk. So it'll just be another treatment of the same. Uh, set of ideas. But so the major thing I want to kind of explain and, and give evidence for is um, why uh, is a is a sort of conjecture of different flavor in the uh, in the simplest arithmetic case, which is unramified automorphic forms over a function field. And uh, and in this case, you can give something kind of very uh, uh, at least a, a conjecture that's that's uh, very plausible and very, um, uh, I should say, exhaustive and of a little bit different nature than the uh, usual uh, uh, Langlands conjectures, for instance, with functoriality and so on. And so the the hope, you know, in terms of what it means to a number theorist, is just to kind of give a, you know, guide or something um, that I, I, sh I should also say many many people have been thinking about these kinds of things recently, but a kind of guide for for uh, you know what more could be just for imagination or, or something. So um, kind of the, 
Uh, how are we doing? Okay. Um, so the the goal is to um, give an arithmetic um, version of the geometric Lang lens conjectures. <clears throat> Um, okay, so uh, so in my setup, I'm gonna kind of primarily be talking about uh, like for the purposes of this talk, I'm essentially always going to be working over uh, the algebraic closure of a finite field, but still let me kind of work in um, two situations. So my kind of geometric setting is gonna be, I'm gonna take K a field, an algebraically closed field, Um, X over K, oops, a uh, smooth projective uh, connected curve. And uh, uh, G over K is going to be a split productive group. Um, and this kind of data gives rise to, on to um, for instance, on G, the moduli stack of G bundles on X. <clears throat> um, okay, and so uh, uh, let's see, anything else I wanna say? Oh yeah, so uh, I'm gonna give some kind of auxiliary notation for, um, for sheaves and so on. Um, so I guess, uh, first of all, I'm going to take E sometimes to be QL bar. So this is the notation we, oh, I, I should have said at the beginning. So everything is joined, um, this big collaboration with, um, Rankin, Gates, Corey, <coughs> Ajdan, uh, Rosenblum. Um, and Varshavsky. No, sorry, Yasha. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm gonna take this field E to be uh, uh, QL bar. And so, and the, just as uh, kind of to orient everyone for a second, so there's gonna be a, kind of the geometry over the field K, and there's also gonna be geometry over the field E. In general, uh, the, the rule of thumb, there's kind of two rules of thumb. So. Uh, everything over K is like involves, well, the group G is only on the field K. Um, and, uh, uh, and sort of all, all of the geometry I care about over K is going to be sort of like, hmm, how to say like kind of topological kind of cohomology, things like a tall cohomology of, of spaces. So I don't really care so much about null potence, uh, and, uh, uh, things like that. Um, what I care about are, for instance, a tall cohomology groups of, of varieties over K. E is going to be uh, kind of different. So I'm going to consider G check the dual group as living over E. And uh, and then I'm going to uh, sort of everything over E is like very derived. So I'm going to have some uh, uh, moduli stacks in a little bit that are involved the dual group and are uh, objects of derived algebraic geometry. And over here, I don't care about um, sort of l cohomology, what I care about is really, uh, yeah, so else K cross. <laughs> um, what I uh, care about is sort of coherent cohomology of spaces, which is why derived algebraic geometry stuff is, is relevant. Okay, so I have this, uh, this sort of data and I'm gonna let, um, I guess uh, if S uh, is a variety over K, I'm going to take um, sheaves on S with a little C to be the sort of DG category of usual um, constructible uh, sheaves. So the C stands for compact and means small. And then I'll take um, end of sheaves on S with a C. I'll call it sheaves on S. 
um, constructible like, E sheaves, Q of R sheaves. Um, and sheaves on S, I'll call the, the end category. So I just sort of formally adjoin infinite co limits of infinite direct sums. Um, and uh, extend um, to stacks, for instance, um, in the usual we way. So, some we cannot oh. right. Let's see. Okay. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, yeah, just keep uh, awesome. telling me this issue. And if things get just too like like this, also tell me. Sam, maybe you can swap the two sides, the two sheets, because this way you don't have, you don't cover the other piece with your hand. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to extend to stacks in the usual way. So a sheaf on, on a stack is a compatible system of sheaves for every scheme mapping to the stack. Um, and I'm also uh, going to let um, uh, Lee's on, uh, on a scheme S. So it's going to be a subcategory of sheaves on S. And this is uh, the subcategory um, where um, all, let's say, perverse, but it doesn't really matter, um, cohomologies of um, F sheaf and S um, can be written as a colimit of finite ring, like sort of usual these cheese. So in other words, there's this notion of Lee's sheaf on, Lee's aliotic sheaf on, on some variety. So it's things like the constant sheaf is, uh, uh, well, you're supposed to think of them as locally constant uh, sheaves. They're the analogs of locally constant sheaves in, in topology. Um, and really you could say like, if you work with Z mod L to the N, you, then that makes sense locally in the ATAL topology and you just sort of build out from those. Um, okay, and I should say that in our papers, this is um, given a, um, we call this kind of thing uh, quasi lees on, on S. It's a sort of fussy name a little bit. And uh, I'm just going to call it lees for today to keep the notation a little simpler. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, uh, so the uh, starting point uh, for us, oh, and I also want to say now, okay, so that's uh, this new kind of the geometric setting. and when I talk about these sheaf theories, it really kind of could be like any, let's say, constructible sheaf theory that you uh, that you imagine. So these, I, I could have also like if my field K were the complex numbers, I could work with constructible Betty sheaves, or I could work with uh, maybe holonomic D modules instead of aliotic sheaves, and just play exactly the same games. Uh, everything goes through verbatim with kind of obvious. Adjustments. The field E will not be QL bar anymore, but will be the appropriate coefficient field. And uh, but for us, this is going to be the setting that we care about. So I'm just saying it this way for definiteness. Um, okay. And then I also have the um, arithmetic setting. Uh, and here, uh, uh, K is assumed to be uh, FQ bar. Um, X is um, find over FQ. So it's given some uh, descent down to FQ. I'm not going to um, introduce a ton of notation, but what I'll say is uh, that the Frobenius for X um, is going to be a map from X to X is like over K. And I'm just going to sort of lazily write X of FQ uh, and variance for you know, maybe more like bungee, uh, 
to be uh, the fixed points. Um, and sort of more importantly, uh, I get uh, sort of Frobenius or Bungie. G is uh, automatically. Uh, oh, the Frobenius is uh, is the Q Frobenius, uh, certainly, uh, in kind of geometric, and uh, G is defined over Z. So I don't really care about explicitly descending it to F Q. Um, okay, so um, yeah, and uh, I forgot to get a, the, the exact estimate I need before the talk, but also P at the very end of the talk, I'm going to want uh, P to be bigger than, I forget, twice the coxeter number plus one, maybe just twice, maybe just the coxeter number, but P should be sort of not, not super small um, for some of the results. Okay, so, um, uh, so now in this case, uh, so, um, so we make the following kinds of definition. So the goal is to define moduli spaces of local systems on this curve X. So uh, in the geometric setting, we're gonna say that um, uh, uh, there's a space we call locus restricted. Uh, it's, I guess why we call it restricted, I, I can try and say in a minute, but it's sort of, the best thing you can get here. So this is just going to be uh, a certain kind of, um, so by its nature, it should live over spec E because it involves G check, that's the heuristic. Um, and uh, and I'll say what kind of thing it is in a, in a minute, but you should think of it as some kind of stack over um, this spec E. And so if I have um, S over E, a test scheme, if you want, it can be affine, um, then a map um, S to Oxus G check restricted is by definition um, equivalent to um, A, and then there's some annoyance here, just to say rate T exact um, symmetric monoidal functor um, from uh, FG check to uh, these of uh, X tensor with what's equal to S, where I'm using this uh, tensor product for EG categories over, over E, maybe it looks abstract, but just uh, if, let me just say, this is um, A mod of these of X, if S is equal to spec A. <laughs> Uh, this is part of the reason why I want to deal with big objects is I want to allow my algebras to be not necessarily finite and uh, and in that case to sort of have a good supply of of modules I just sort of want to work with end objects so I can take like a constant local system and tensor it up with a polynomial algebra in one variable and have that count as a constant map from a1 into so uh, what's the meaning of this formula so uh, very briefly, just forget about S for a moment. So in that case, like kind of, this is a very Tanakian sort of definition and the sort of Tanakian interpretation of what a G check local system is. Is there a little discussion back there? No, but do you mind uh, spelling it out for GLN? Sure, so for GLN, uh, there's a statement that if you have, so let's forget um, S for, for a moment. Uh, so for, uh, uh, so just take S to be a point for, for just the moment. I feel like the light's weird, but okay. So in this case, 
giving a, a tensor functor from rep G L N into some symmetric monoidal category, you can see that it actually just amounts to the data of some, like let's say abelian category. You can see that it just amounts to the data of an object of that's like a, a dualizable and uh, has dimension N in, in the kind of indolin sense of dimension. Uh, I think I think it's usual. Um, so in that case, what this is saying is just like, you know, the data is just going to be some rank n object inside of this category of least sheaves. So for like a typical, I mean, everything here is characteristic zero. Maybe I, well, like the representation theory. So it's some very uh, you know, what, what does a representation look like over here? Maybe it's the dual to the standard one. Then you take the dual to your local system, or maybe it's some symmetric power. So you take the symmetric power of your local system, or maybe it's some exterior power, and then you take the exterior power of your local system. And uh, uh, the fact that it should have dimension n is encoded by the fact that the n plus first exterior power, of the standard representation is zero. <clears throat> so that it better be true over here. And the nth one is invertible, so that better be true over here, which uh, ends up telling you that it had to have been a rank n. Uh, if your group was, uh, you know, uh, uh, a classical group, it'll be a local system of the given rank with an inner product of the uh, given type. Um, you can see. Now, when we have s involved, this is sort of some kind of natural uh, notion. So, for instance, whenever I had an e point of s, then I'm going to get a rank n local system. So it's sort of you think of it, this is somehow a family of, of local systems of rank n parameterized by uh, the scheme S. Does so that yeah, answer your question? Thank you. Um, and um, let's see. Um, and yeah, the, the right T exact is just to kind of be reduced to the abelian categories. Otherwise, you get slightly too much stuff for, for GM, for instance. You could have taken a rank one local system in cohomological degree one or something. Um, and it, the, this, this annoyance is just to rule out that kind of um, stupid construction. Um, OK. And now in the arithmetic setting, so this is just a functor on uh, affine schemes. And by its nature, it works perfectly well for derived affine schemes. So uh, over E, I sort of implicitly will use derived algebraic geometry everywhere. If you don't know, don't worry about it. Because if you do know, you probably don't worry about it so much either. <laughs> I mean, it, <laughs> but, yeah. uh, it's very important for, for getting the, um, uh, the stuff right. But at a level of a talk, maybe it's uh, excessive precision. So uh, in the arithmetic setting, then I'm uh, then I obtain um, a Frobenius map. I call it quote unquote Frobenius. Um, uh, I'll say phi from locus g check restricted to locus g check restricted. Um, so this is going to be a map of schemes over QL bar, which is um, slightly funny. And uh, by definition, it'll send some sigma um, to be the inverse image of sigma under this Frobenius. So in other words, this guy has this uh, Frobenius pullback certainly symmetric monoidal and so on. And so I can just obtain a new local system out of my, uh, my sigma. Um, how should you think about this Frobenius? So here's a kind of toy model. From a, okay, so first of all, it's we call it Frobenius, but it's not at all like Frobenius. So uh, for instance, it's in characteristic zero. So it's, it's just, it's a different kind of thing. Um, uh, how should you think about this? So a good toy model is to think about aladic cohomology of of your uh, scheme of your curve X. So this is something in degrees zero, one, and two. So locus behaves somehow like this if you shifted everything down by one. So the, the H1 is kind of in degree zero, 
the H0 is in degree minus one and the H2 is in degree one. And what you should think is that this H1 is somehow, uh, it's like a vector space. So you get, and it's gonna be the bulk of somehow the data, you get this vector space over E and, uh, and that's a perfectly good scheme. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and then this H0 in degree minus one would contribute a little bit of stackiness to the picture. And the H2 in degree one will contribute a little bit of derivativeness to the, to the picture. Now, when, and all of that's again, perfectly kind of good derived stack over, uh, over QL bar. Now, uh, uh, in the case again, that X was defined over a finite field, then of course the Aladdin cohomology picks up a Frobenius and, uh, and that would sort of, it's an automorphism of that chain complex. It will give you an automorphism of this EG stack. And so that's what you should think of this Frobenius as, as doing is some kind of non-abelian version of, of the um, Frobenius acting on Aladdin cohomology or nonlinear version of it. Um, and maybe at first approximation, you can think it's like multiplication by Q on some vector space or something like that. Uh, that's like, that's a bad picture to have, but um, you know, there are worse pictures. Uh, and and what and maybe the heuristic I just explained would be if you replace G check everywhere with GA, you would get literally the example I just said. So it doesn't have to be a reductive group in this story. It can be any FN algebraic group. <clears throat> Um, I heard some discussion. Was there a question? No. Okay. Um, so then uh, uh, we set uh, the uh, arithmetic version of log sys g check to be um, the fixed points here um, under the Frobenius or for, but just call it capital Phi. <clears throat> um, this is, uh, so first of all, in the analogy I just said, you would think about that as kind of the cohomology, not of not of X, but somehow of the actual arithmetic curve over FQ. And, uh, um, and uh, kind of uh, explicitly, um, this has a, sort of functor of points description before. Um, but we use um, Bay local systems. I think local, system, local systems, I'm really gonna kind of use interchangeably with these sheets. Bay local systems on X instead. <clears throat> Um, so, maybe I'll put like two. No question. Maybe maybe these are X. Go ahead, go ahead. Fixed point. Uh, so, could you repeat that? Um, uh, I, I didn't understand. So, uh, when you're talking about cohomology, so you're talking about uh, uh, H1 being concentrated in degree zero. H two in degree minus one, H zero in degree in degree one. Um, um, oh, and you referred to the middle cohomology as a sheaf, uh, and then one of them as as stacky, and one of them as derived. What are you referring to exactly? And, and could you explain uh, uh, those three that that, that trichotomy? Um, okay, I didn't refer to it as a sheaf. I refer to it as a scheme. So it's just like you have a vector right. space, and you so if. Basically, if you have a vector space, uh, you can get uh, uh, a couple kinds of data out of it. Let's just say a finite dimensional vector space over a field. One is that there's like a scheme attached to it. It's just like affine n space, but you didn't choose a basis. So it's spec of the symmetric power of V dual. Um, you can, in derived algebraic geometry, you can basically play the same game for v, a chain complex and it will produce the same but, well, but let me just say explicitly what happens. So also if you have your vector space, let's say V, you can think of it as an additive group and you can take its classifying stack. So that's gonna be something kind of stacky. And uh, under the, there's some dictionary here that basically will correspond to a vector space in degree, in cohomological degree minus one. 
And another thing you can do is take the derived fiber product. That's what derived algebraic geometry loves, zero times zero over V. Um, and that kind of thing, the dictionary says, will correspond to V in degree plus one. So zero times zero over V, if you look in Hartshorn, it's definitely zero. But uh, if you look in, uh, I don't know, Lurie, it's not zero. Um, it's, it's got a little bit of derived no potent stuff. Um, and and that's uh, that's the kind of some some sort of picture for how this thing's coming up and why it's derived and, and so on. It, the derivedness has to do with H two of the curve. Does that answer your question? Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Did, did you maybe put some more light on the paper? It might, it's kind of in the shadow. So, yeah. What's that? <laughs> I don't know, it might make things worse. <laughs> Does that help? <laughs> no? Oh. I think it In that case, no. <laughs> it might be uh, our projection. Okay, okay. Light on the laptop. All right. No, can do something with our projection. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not doing much. Um, okay, so um, so there are some kind of uh, uh, let me just say very quickly we have some uh, representability theorems. <laughs> what? That's like before. <laughs> 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 okay, <clears throat> so we have some representability theorems. You can say more about it. I've said more in other talks. I'm not going to get too hard into it right now. But uh, this moduli of restricted local systems, it, it is what it is. It's, there are better things in life, but it's a kind of formal algebraic stack. Uh, it has infinitely many connected components. And just sort of very briefly, let me say, you can think about the connected components. So kind of, what, what could you possibly do to vary a local system, like an l local system? It's kind of hard to imagine. One sort of thing you can do is consider like some vector space of extensions between two local systems and uh, and sort of do like a bare scaling thing. And that would give you a real honest, like one dimensional family of, of uh, you know, local systems. It's not something formal or something like that. Like we're very used to doing formal deformation theory with with a uh, local system, especially irreducible ones. But if it, it's not irreducible, you really can sort of vary some kind of extensions that, that appear. Uh, and one thing we prove is that that's the only thing that can possibly happen in this space. So the connected components uh, are in a suitable sense, equivalence classes of semi simplification types of local systems. Um, uh, and, uh, and so that's going to give you your infinitely many components. So you can't, if you try to do like a real physical change inside of this locus G check restricted, something non-formal, you're never going to change the uh, the uh, semi simplification of your local system. Um, by contrast, this locus. So I say infinitely many components. It's like typically the case, like P one. That's not going to happen. But. So this Luxus G check arithmetic is a, a nicer. This just is a quasi compact algebraic stack.
Um, uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to set as a as a goal to uh, um, construct a certain sheaf. Um, that we call um, drinf, um on this space of arithmetic local systems in the arithmetic setting um, with the basic property um, that the global sections of DRINF um, are compactly supported functions on um, on bungee of FQ um, and uh, so the the um, uh, the construction I'm going to give actually uh, uh, works well. Maybe there are details written in, in the missing in the in the exposition, but it works. Uh, in the ramified situation as, as well. And, uh, and it's really based on a theorem of uh, Song Shui and a bunch of kind of formal work that uh, we did, but the non-formal content was in her work. Um, and the kind of, and this is what uh, Shimon in his talk called, I think, uh, A. And the kind of thesis here is that uh, Drinf is um, a better object to study. So these are some kind of, uh, you know, you should think about these as some auto unramified automorphic forms. Um, so kind of a little bit algebraic version, but so the thesis is that this drink is a better object um, to study um, than the right-hand side. And I'll sort of return to that later. Okay, so the sun's really coming out here. Is it, it's, let me try adjusting. Let's see, did that make things much worse? It's okay. It's okay, all right. Sam, can you explain, can you mention the word Langlands parameters and explain the relation? <laughs> Langlands parameters? Yes. I never said Langlands parameters, but I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but so, I mean, maybe what you're asking for is, so this, uh, this looks as arithmetic, you should think of, this is some, somehow the moduli space of, of, or stack or whatever you want to call it, of local systems on the geometric curve. This is the moduli stack of a local systems by construction. I, that's not, what are you, what are you asking for? For, for example, um, do you have anything similar to the restricted case where um, things are separated into semi-simple, class of semi-simple Langland parameters? Uh, no, the space is much more complicated somehow than, uh, than the space. The space is somehow easier to understand. The geometry here is much uh, trickier. So I mean, the thing you can say is that, um, I mean, it's exactly like in Shin Wen's talk and, and hopefully I'll get to say it again later, but that if you have like an elliptic or discrete parameter that just is gonna correspond to essentially, you know, a, a smooth point maybe with some stabilizer group inside of this, uh, side of the stack. So it'll just be sort of isolated and and lovely. But if you look sort of near the like trivial representation or something like this, it's going to be um, somehow much more of a um, of a mess. Okay. <clears throat> so so um, uh, sorry. But, maybe well maybe maybe I can just say say one quick thing there. So. Uh, that's just this. So in my mind, I mean, kind of the definition we gave um, 
at the end of the day, really all it uses is like the representation somehow of this like pi one et al. Um, and it, I, okay, let's say the curve is a k pi one or I can kind of ignore it, drive stuff a little bit. Um, so in the restricted case, that, that's the kind of group that appears. If I played the same game with a kind of discrete group, like, you know, actual pi one of some uh, some space, this this is going to be the just moduli of, of Betty local systems. That's something which is, you know, it has, uh, it's at least it, it's potentially connected in, in some kind of cases. It's it's an honest algebraic stack, so it doesn't separate out the semi-simplification classes at all. This looks as arithmetic. It's sort of a mix of the two settings because it's kind of representations of the vague group, which has some part that's like some profinite group, and it has some part that's like Z. And so it's a little bit of a, of a mixture in some sense of, of some kind of like Betty local systems just from, come related to that Z component somehow and uh, and the sort of etal looks as restricted kind of data. So that's why um, the kinds of general theorems we prove here don't, don't apply. Does that, I don't know if that answers your question, but basically it's, I would say it's, it's hard to say. Yeah, thank you. There was another question. Yeah, I have a um, more trivial question. It's roughly about where apart from uh, geometric setting to arithmetic setting. So here, here you, you are writing these x to do me x based into to k bar, or oh, sorry, based into k of is x over f two. I, I think x is over k. Okay. okay. Even if it is x to f two. Okay. X is over k. Yeah, so. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I might not, not have understood, but just, yeah, everything is is over K, except I have, I, when I descend to finite field, I remember the Q for Benius, the geometric Q for Benius on the algebraic closure of of, uh, of K, of FQ, I mean, which is K. So that's, a, that's a map over over K perfectly well. And uh, and my right bungee of FQ, it, it does mean the FQ points of the descended thing, but it's also the fixed points of uh, for Benius thought of as some kind of stack over respect K. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's um, Yeah, so kind of, I guess uh, I'll say goal one is this, and uh, goal two is to show that um, Drinf can be computed um, uh, using the geometric limits conjectures. Um, okay. And I think those are goals, but I'm all right. Moving slowly, slower than I was hoping, which is just the way it goes. Okay, so uh, let me just say, okay. So the goal is to. <laughs> So the goal is to um, to give this drinf, which requires some kind of like extra structure around. So I mean, just it's like total spoiler alert. This is uh, going to be constructed using uh, a Stuka kind of construction. <clears throat> but um, but the uh, uh, let me still just give very briefly a, a quick quick kind of word about this. So what we're I mean, ultimately what we're gonna end up using is the existence of like these Hecke functors acting on sheaves on bungee. So we need to like, if we're gonna do this, like I know what this right-hand side is and I'm trying to give it extra structure. And somehow that extra structure involves the Langland's dual group. What do I know about the Langland's dual group? What I know is like that, uh, uh, you know, like, what I know is, you know, it's sort of a priori is basically that like Hecke operators act on automorphic forms. And uh, maybe maybe one of the things I should have said in the beginning is that like one of the really remarkable things from, well, when I was in when I was in grad school was when the Solid Forks paper came out and showed that like using Hecke functors really gives you like extra arithmetic information. Um, it gives you more than just Hecke operators and it lets you 
prove this spectral decomposition, which again was another result that was very striking and outside of anything I saw in the usual in, in the textbook about what the Langlands conjecture said. So, um, so I want to say something about this, and I'm just going to kind of very briefly say some things about traces. So let's say that Y is maybe a finite set. <clears throat> and um, I have some F from Y to Y. And my goal is to count the fixed points of, of this F. So uh, the order of the fixed points of F um, is, uh, you know, one funny way that you could write it is that you could say that this is the trace of the map like F, I don't know, upper star. I'm sorry. I don't know why I wrote that. Okay, trace of the map F upper star from functions on Y to functions on Y. So this is a sort of very uh, uh, classical sort of picture. Um, and now if I, uh, so geometrically, um, the sort of old idea <clears throat> is that if now y is a the stack, let's say, some site, some type, I have f from y to y, uh, then I can play the following sort of categorical version of this game. So what I'm going to want to do is take some kind of um, uh, uh, trace of of some kind of operator and uh, I play the following game, basically. So I'm going to form sheaves on y times y. And uh, I can take the pullback of, so I'm, I think about these sheaves on y times y as actually, this is like going to be sort of, heuristically, you should think of these as functors from y to y. Uh, namely, you can pull back to y, let's say in the star sense, you do a star, sorry, you take a sheaf on y, you pull back to y times y, let's say in the star sense, you tensor with your given sheaf, some kind of kernel, and uh, and then you push forward to the other factor, let's say in the shriek sense. Um, and in this case, I can pull back uh, some sheaf along the diagonal, and then I can take, um, C sub C for compactly supported cohomology. And this is going to produce for me a, a vector space. So all my categories and things are over E. So it's a QL bar vector space. And this composition, I'm going to call trace geometric. So I should say also, when you think of things as sheaves of Y times Y, if, if you haven't seen this before, that's very similar to thinking of matrices as like in a square. Um, uh, okay, so I call this trace geometric, and then uh, we could take the the operator that's going to correspond to my my f. Oops, I wrote for but it should be f upper star of delta f times the identity upper star of delta lower shriek of e, but like the constant sheaf on y which is also just a name for the graph of F lower shriek of E. Um, and this is some object in sheaves on Y times Y and it's geometric trace. Is CC of Y um, fixed points. It's in fact this word cohomology of, of this just by base change. Um, um, so uh, now for Y, well, I should say for F being Frobenius, so I assume now that my field is the algebraic closure of, of a finite field and Y was defined over that finite field, um, this Y F to the identity is just the FQ points of why I thought it was some kind of like, like let's say it's a scheme. This is just some uh, finite set. Maybe let's say it's a quasi compact scheme. This is some finite set that uh, lives over 
uh, that I think of as living over FQ bar in the obvious way. So that's what I mean when I write this formula. If Y is a stack, then there's some finite automorphism groups everywhere. <clears throat> um, so it's a kind of Dillon Mumford stack, but essentially discrete kind of thing. Um, so for, um, in particular for Y equals um, on G, uh, this gives rise to a formula for, um, well, I, maybe I should say in general that the CC of Y of FQ now is just gonna be compactly supported functions on Y of FQ. I'll scratch up this. Sorry for the messiness. So this has given me some kind of formula for compactly supported functions on, on Y of FQ as a, as a kind of trace. Now, in the case when Y is equal to bun G, um, there's extra structure. Um, acting on sheaves of bun G. These are uh, so-called Hecke functors. And so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, play the same game, but kind of replacing identity everywhere with Hecke functors. And this is uh, this is uh, essentially what uh, uh, Shuka's are designed to do. Um, and what we'll see is that kind of that that structure just by itself kind of uh, solves many problems. So uh, let me kind of give some quick um, background on FA functors. So I'm going to use FA functors in like a slightly sophisticated form. Um, and that's uh, too bad. <laughs> um, <clears throat> No, I mean, I, I, I want to go through it slowly because um, maybe it's not familiar to everyone in the audience. So the first thing is that kind of step zero in a little bit of a hierarchy I'm going to build is that if I have, so I'm going to do a little bit building up a logic of, of the kinds of things I can do. So if I have a representation of G check, um, then uh, this is going to um, uh, give rise to a, a functor from sheaves on bun G to sheaves on bun G times X with the property that it's star fiber at a point of um, X is the sort of like Hecke functor. At, at this point, so I'll be a little bit formal about this, but essentially what you're supposed to imagine is that in like usual, if you've seen usual Langland stuff before, whenever you have a representation of the dual group and a point, you're supposed to get some uh, some operator. Uh, oh, well, a point where everything's unramified, you get some operator on automorphic forms. And in geometry, we can actually sort of vary that point uh, in some sense continuously. And whether I take star or streak fiber here, it turns out only matters by, by a shift. It's in some sense constant along the, the curve. Um, and really this is gonna be kind of given, this functor, it, it, it refines a little bit. It's given by, um, by uh, an object a sort of kernel kind of object, a sub v, which is a sheaf on bun g times bun g times x of exactly the type we're, and I'm gonna make this more of a curly k, um, of exactly the type that we were discussing earlier. So if I have a functor, so I think of this as on bun g times bun g times x, and then it's giving me a functor of this type. And so this, uh, this functor has the extra structure of, of coming from a kernel.
So next up is that if I have some uh, I tuple of representations, this is going to give rise to the same kind of data. Um, so here, this is representation of G check to the I. Well, no, I don't have any data. So this will again give rise to somehow a Hecke functor from sheaves on bun G to sheaves on bun G times X to the I. So this is a sort of part of the, the symmetry property of, of uh, Hecke functors. So what you should imagine is like, if I have, let's say two representations, I can like, and let's say two points of the curve, when those points are different, I can just apply the Hecke functors at those two points. And when the points are the same, I can like compose the two Hecke functors in either order. It's the same as the Hecke functor for the tensor product. And uh, this is kind of encoding that kind of data, but with maybe more than two points. And um, yeah, and this is somehow part of the, this is the geometric explanation for the commutativity of operators. Um, so I get this and uh, it's KV again, which is a sheaf on, on G times on G times this X to the I. <clears throat> Um, and now a, a slight variant. So, uh, yeah. If I'm given, you know, as above, the uh, tuple of representations. So this is a sort of convenient way of packaging the the above construction. Actually, it's like slightly lossy, but that turns out not to matter in this case. Um, and I take f some sheaf on x to the i, <clears throat> then I can obtain um, a representation, sorry, a functor from sheaves on bun g to sheaves on bun g um, by, uh, by taking uh, um, uh, HV, and then essentially uh, tensoring with F along the third, I guess, along the second factor. And pushing forward to, to uh, Bungie. In other words, I think about this F, like I can just sort of well, pull it back to uh, to here, and then it's giving me. Well, if I think about f as a sheaf on x to the i, it's giving me a functor from sheaves on x to the i to vect by this favorite construction, and I'm just essentially applying that along the second factor. Um, and it turns out, I should say, uh, remark, it's like up to shift. Um, can do so. This is a kind of technical comment, but. Could also have chosen other functors here. You can do a tensor shriek, and star push forward. So the fact that shriek equals star push forward is just the x is proper, and uh, the difference between these two is some ULA-ness property of these type of things. And sort of again, oops, um, I have this k of v comma f in sheaves on bun g times bun g. Um, okay. Uh, question. Yeah. Are, are you defining the tensor product in terms of the pullback along the diagonal? Uh, is that why you have star and, and shriek? Like, what's going on? Uh, why do I have star and shriek here? Star and shriek tensor products. Oh yeah. Uh, so this is a uh, yeah. I should have said. So this is what people. Okay. This is it's exactly this is um. The star pullback along the diagonal map. This is the shriek pullback along the diagonal map. That was your question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is somehow like uh, for topologists or for people working with aliotic sheaves, which is kind of topological. Usually you like upper star and lower shriek. And for people working with D modules, it's usually upper shriek and lower star. And uh, somehow the, if you're working with constructible sheaves, it's a question of personal preference, uh, essentially. In this context, 
it's convenient to do upper star lower shriek things and that's kind of that's sort of what's what's happening as i run along but at some point we'll run into run into this uh very slightly and that's kind of why i'm doing this if you try to really do a certain exercise at a certain point in this i guess next talk then uh then this would be a helpful thing to know so um yeah somehow these ones a priori play better with traces a little bit in uh, a categorical sense okay uh, are there any quick questions uh, i have a quick question yes when you question. say that this object is given by kv what does that mean like these functions are given by kv so when i say yeah so if i have k a sheaf on like y times z let's say this gives rise to like a functor f sub k and let's say sheaves on y to sheaves on z except like for us i might have got let me not it's going to be bungee times bungee and i might always swap the factors just but uh this by definition will be the following construction so i pull back my sheaf f i tensor with this kernel and then i push forward to z um, so this is a lossy operation. When I take sheaves here and produce functors, uh, it's uh, uh, it's like it's not conservative, for instance. Um, but the uh, but somehow, if for lots of nice functors, this the the functors are naturally sort of given by kernels, and I'm sort of explicitly saying that that's the case for these Hecke functors. And I a little bit can't just think about the functors, which would make life a little bit easier, but I have to think about somehow these kernels that give rise to them. 